Hi, I'm John Stevenson. We're going to be looking at Josiah in 2 Kings chapters 22 and 23. If we go back two verses to chapter 21, verses 23 and 24, we see that the servants of Ammon, this is Josiah's father, conspired against him and killed the king in his own house. And then the people of the land killed all those who had conspired against King Ammon. And the people of the land made Josiah, his son, king in his place. So Josiah comes to the throne unexpectedly, not that he would eventually come to the throne, but this was not by plan. This was not where his father had gotten sick or old, and but it was an assassination that suddenly brought him to the throne. And now we begin in chapter 22, verse 1. Josiah was eight years old when he became king. Remember, his father had only reigned a couple of years before this assassination. And so his father was still fairly young. Josiah, eight years old when he became king, and he reigned 31 years in Jerusalem, and his mother's name was Jedediah, the daughter of Edediah and of uh, Bozkath. He did right in the sight of the Lord and walked in all the way of his father, David, nor did he turn aside to the right and the left. So the overall judgment, we're told, is that he's going to follow the Lord. But notice, he comes to the throne at the age of eight. And I have to wonder... Who is it who's leading him? Who is it who's guiding him? Who is it who's giving him advice that he walks from this very early age in the way of the Lord? Now, we find out that in the 18th year of his reign, he begins a series of reforms. Now, when I compare this with the parallel passage in 2 Chronicles, 2 Chronicles uh, tells us that some things begin to be reformed in the eighth year of his reign, and then it it actually says, just to let you know that's not a typo or something, uh, while he was still quite young. So eighth year of his reign, he you know considering he came to the throne at the age of eight, he he would have only been sixteen years old. Um, now is that the same thing as we find here? In the 18th year, 8 and 18, you can see where somebody, uh, I, I suppose a typo uh, could have been possible. Or perhaps it's not a typo. Perhaps it's accurate that his some of his reforms began as early as his, the 8th year of his reign, when he was only 16 years old. But now more reforms continue at this time. And I don't know which it is. I'm not really trying to unravel that. But in any case, by the 18th year of his reign, or 8th, however it is, some reforms begin and jo uh, Josiah instructs uh, Hilkiah, the high priest, to begin the work of restoring the temple, which had been desecrated and was still in its desecrated state these many years after Josiah has already been king. And so this involves major construction work. It's not just, you know, go in and dust off the furniture, but rather there are parts of the temple, which by now is several hundred years old and has been in the past looted. Uh, different gold ornaments have been stripped off to pay off bribes to the Assyrians. Uh, it has the, the temple's actually been through some difficult times, and time has sh probably taken its toll as well. And so this involves major construction to the temple as it is being refurbished, and I don't want to say rebuilt, but certainly um, brought back to at least a measure of what might have been its former glory. We, Hilkiah uh, reports on finding the book of the law, and he takes this book of the law, the high priest, while they're doing this, these constructions, uh, apparently it had been filed away or lost somewhere in the temple, and he gives it to Shaphan the scribe, and Shaphan comes and reads it in the presence of the king. Remember that literacy was, at this point in history, usually something that only a scribe, maybe a professional reader could do. Not everyone was able to read and write. First of all, you wouldn't have that many things on which you could read and write. Uh, if you had a scroll, that could be written perhaps on papyri, but that would have had to have been imported up from Egypt. Not impossible. Uh, or you could have... Uh, uh, Various animal sorts of skins, like a, a sheep or a calf, could be taken, and after they've been killed, the skin could be scraped off um, in order to uh, provide what we call parchment. Parchment is animal skin, and this was one of the ways you could have something on which to read and write. Of course, a, a lot of what we found have been in the in the 
a realm of tablets, clay tablets, and pieces of broken pottery. Um, but already, this was a thing. Notice, uh, they find a book of the law. Now, the word book there, sefer, can equally refer to a scroll, and probably does, because the idea of binding a book on one side, the pages on one side together, like we do with a book, that really hadn't been invented yet, to the best of our knowledge, and, and wouldn't be until the first century. Verse 11, when the king heard the words of the book of the law, they bring it to him, they read what presumably is the scroll, and he tore his clothes. This isn't just like, oops, I ripped my... This is a sign of his great emotional upheaval. He hears what the law said, and remember that the law had not only blessings, the law also contained cursings. Here's all the curse things that are going to happen if you don't obey the law. And and the king heard the words of the law, and he says, oh my goodness, we have broken every one of those laws. Verse 12, then the king commanded Hilkiah the priest, uh, Ahikam the son of Shaphan, Akbor the son of Makiah, Shaphan the scribe, and Isaiah, that's not the same as Isaiah from, from the book of Isaiah, this is a later person with a similar name, the king's servant, and he says to them, go inquire of the Lord for me and on behalf of the people and all of Judah concerning the words of this book that has been found. For great is the wrath of the Lord that burns against us because our fathers have not listened to the words of this book nor uh, to do all that's written uh, concerning us. You know, he, he hears the words of the book. He hears the curses that are put on for disobedience. And he hears that list of things that would involve disobedience. And he says, we have broken all of those. And, and what's more, we've been breaking them for a long time. Verse 14, so Hilkiah the priest, Ahikam, Akbor, Shaphan, and Isaiah went to Huldah the prophetess. Now, I love this about Huldah. Uh, she's a prophetess because she's a woman. Um, and notice she's the wife of Shalom, the son of Tikvah, the son of Harhash. Uh, keeper of the wardrobe. So her husband has sort of a semi-VIP position within the staff. Um, and then by explanation, it says, now she lived in Jerusalem in the second quarter, and they spoke to her. They don't go to her husband, even though he has an important position. They go to her because she has a reputation for being a prophetess. Now, this tells me something that we've we've read about prophets in the Old Testament. We haven't read too much about prophetesses, that is, women uh, who had this gift of prophecy, but there were some, and she was one of those. If you go to Jerusalem today, uh, on the south side of the Temple Mount, you will see several gates. They've been walled up, but you can still see the outline of the gate. Uh, here's two of them here. Uh, the, the picture actually cuts off one of them. So there's, there's actually three together, and then you move a little bit to the west, and there's two more. And these are known as the Hulda Gates. They are named after the prophetess Hulda. Uh, and they were there in Jesus' day at the time of the Second Temple. Now, they weren't there in in the days of Second Kings, because the, the new temple, the, the rebuilt temple, had not built been built yet. Um, but Hulda now prophesies, and in her prophecy, she says that God is going to bring evil upon Jerusalem because of the sin of the people. All those, all those curses that were given in the law, they're going to be fulfilled. And that's bad. But because the heart of the king has been tender and humble before the Lord, Hulda goes on to say this calamity will not take place in his lifetime. That judgment's coming, but it will be delayed because of the faithfulness of Josiah. So notice there's a prophecy, and it's going to be fulfilled, but not yet because of the faithfulness of God's servant, and eventually we're going to see of God's people, which tells me something about prophecies. There are some prophecies that are they're just going to be fulfilled, but even then, in what we consider sometimes an unconditional prophecy, and I'm not saying that this necessarily is, but even an unconditional prophecy, sometimes aspects of that might be diverted or changed, or at least in this case, di delayed, because of conditions that people fulfill. Chapter 23, verse 1, Then the king sent, he's just heard the words of this prophecy, and they gathered to him all the elders of Judah, and of Jerusalem. Verse 2, the king went up to the house of the Lord, 
and all the men of Judah and all the inhabitants of Jerusalem with him. So they're not going to do this in the king's palace or at the gate of the city, but before the temple. And not only the people, but the priests and the prophets and all the people, both small and great. This is pretty much everywhere, everyone. And he read in their hearing all the words of the book of the covenant, which was found in the house of the Lord. So the same, the same scroll, uh, what was this scroll? Was this the Torah, perhaps? Was this just one of the books of the Torah, perhaps? Perhaps the book of Leviticus, perhaps the book, I like to think maybe it was the book of Deuteronomy. I don't, don't want to say, though, because I don't know. But they take this book of the law, and now it's read in the presence of everyone. Small, great, priests, prophets, regular people, nobles, all of them hear the words of the covenant. And notice what it's called, the book of the covenant. Verse 3, the king stood by the pillar, and he made a covenant. Uh, the Hebrew, very commonly, whenever you see something about making a covenant, and here is a case too, uh, he cut, literally, he cut a covenant. Because when you, when you made a covenant, what you did is you actually t- took an animal and you killed it, and you cut that, the body in two, and you separated it. And you were, what, you, what you were doing when you cut a covenant, you were saying, if I don't keep my parts of the covenant, May what happened to that animal happen to me. Now, now the book of the law records how Israel had done that way back then. And so the king goes through those same actions. He cuts a covenant saying, look, you know, we're still part of that covenant, but we're going to renew this. We're going to, it's almost like a, a re-ratification of that old covenant. They made a covenant before the Lord to walk after the Lord and to keep his commandments and his testimonies and his statutes with all his heart and all his soul to carry out the words of this covenant that were written in the book. And all of the people entered into the covenant. So not only does the king make it, but everyone who's there participates in this re-ratification of the covenant. And now Josiah begins to make some reforms. First of all, the vessels and the idols of Baal are burned in the Kidron Valley. Now, I'm, I'm giving you a sort of a topographical map of the of the area of Jerusalem. The part that you see in color was the part that was there in Josiah's day. You can see the outline of the later wall. That there's, If you go there, those walls are still present today. Um, and where the walls were, there, there, there might not have been walls in those areas. In some, actually, there were. But there were people living that were around the city. Um, and notice the vessels and idols were burned in the Kidron. The Kidron is that valley on the east side to your right. You can see the Kidron mentioned there. That valley that, that is right next, and it's a very steep valley. Uh, and the vessels and idols of Baal are burned there. But then the ashes are taken and the ashes are removed. They're not, the ashes aren't even left there. They're taken away up to Bethel to the north. And Josiah goes on to do away with the idolatrous priests. Uh, Any priests that had been leading the people wrongly are taken and killed. He overturns the place of burning that was in the Hinnom Valley. Now, notice you've got that that, uh, Kidron Valley on the east side, but then that valley intersects with another valley on the south and on the west side, and that's known as the Hinnom Valley. Uh, This was uh, a place where they had actually had um, places of burning. When I say burning, they would erect idols there and altars and not only have burnt offerings, but they would take children, living children, and throw them into the fire to burn them alive as human sacrifices to these pagan gods. And he overturns that place. And it becomes, eventually it becomes the town garbage heap. Even today, if you go to the to the Hinnom Valley, um, nowadays most of it has been turned into a park, but there's nobody that lives there. There's no worship that goes there. There's no uh, synagogues or temples or anything like that. In fact, for a long time, it became the town garbage heap. Uh, And even even the times I've been there, and I've driven past it on a number of occasions, and every time, even though a good section of it has been turned into a park, every time there was somebody burning garbage. Maybe not a lot of garbage, maybe only a, a big canful or something like that. But there was always garbage being burnt, even even to this day. We also read that the high places and the pagan temples were destroyed. Uh, what you see here is the 
the ruins and they've done an archaeological dig and they put a metal frame uh, not in order to do sacrifices because that was actually destroyed. Uh, this is the high place at Dan. There was another one just like it at Bethel. Uh, the two places were where golden calves had been set up. And Josiah said, he goes outside of Judah. This was not in Judah. This was up in the territory of uh, the former nation of Israel. And he, But he goes there and he destroys the, those high places and those pagan temples. And he says, look, even though that's outside of his land, uh, that's, that was part of God's people, and we're going to put an end to that as well. He breaks down the altar at Bethel. Like I said, this is the altar that we're looking at at Dan. Um, maybe that one was already gone. I, I don't know the details, but there was one much like it at Bethel. And the, as I said, the priests of the high places are put to death. Any priest that had been leading the people astray, had been leading them into idolatry, had been leading them to worship pagan gods, they were all put to death. He next removes the pagan altars from the temple because there were altars that had been established. We saw this in the days of Manasseh. Uh, they had actually built some additional altars in front of the temple uh, to worship pagan gods uh, in, this, in this religious pluralism of the day. And he removes that and the temple will now be dedicated to the Lord. It will only be for the worship of the Lord. That's what it means for it to be Holy. It is set apart only to God. Chapter 23, verse 21. And then the king commanded all the people, saying, Celebrate the Passover to the Lord your God, as it is written in this book of the covenant. Surely such a Passover had not been celebrated from the days of the judges who judged Israel, nor in all the days of the kings of Israel and of the kings of Judah. Um, all that time, throughout the rest of the book of, of Judges, and you know Saul and David and Solomon, and the, the United Kingdom and the Divided Kingdom, we never read of them celebrating the Passover. But now they're going to do that. Now, uh, we just have a brief mention here, if, we, if you want a fuller treatment of that first Passover uh, that was celebrated in the days of Josiah, you'd have to go to Second Chronicles, but we're not going to do that. Verse 25, before, before him there was no king like him who turned to the Lord with all his heart and with all his soul and with all his might, according to all the law of Moses, nor did any like him arise after him. Josiah is going to be the last good king of Israel. And notice, uh, where we read here, he was, the, he was the best of all that came before him, presumably ever since David, and, and maybe he would give David a run for his money, I don't know. Uh, and he's going to be the last of the good kings of Judah as well. Now we're going to look at sort of an overview. I want you to see the flow of the passages of these two chapters. We began with an introductory summary of Josiah's reign about how he was going to be a good king. Uh, and then we read that account of how Hilkiah discovers the book of the law and how they read it. And uh, after talking to uh, Huldah the prophetess, they found out about the inevitability of the judgment because of the disobedience of the fathers. But yet Josiah would be spared, and the kingdom would be spared as long as Josiah was alive. And so uh, that was in verses 3 through 20. Next, we had the assembly in Jerusalem for the covenant renewal, where uh, at the beginning of chapter 23, all of Judah, whether whether you know major or minor or kings or nobles or priests or everybody was gathered together in order for this covenant renewal, for this re-ratification of the covenant. Uh, and then we read of Josiah's reforms. We've been looking at those in chapter 23, verses 4 through 20. Uh, that's the pivotal point. Uh, and now we say, see a second assembly. Uh, that's the assembly that we just read about for the Passover, where they come together, they celebrate the Passover. Nobody had done this ever since the days of the judges. Um, and then we again have a uh, statement about how Josiah fully obeyed the law, uh, the book of the law that Hilkiah had discovered. And it, had been dis it had been discovered back in chapter 22. Now it's been fully obeyed. And yet again, there's a reference of the inevitability of that judgment because of the sins of the Father. So uh, we've sort of come full circle, and now we come to the concluding summary, but it's not going to be, you know, we're used to the concluding summary just being, uh, and these things are written in, in the books of uh, Chronicles, and so you can go look at it. But it actually tells us some significant parts to the story. 
And so chapter 23, verse 29, in his days, that is in the days of Josiah, and these are going to be the closing days of Josiah. We've just jumped forward to the end of his reign. Pharaoh Necho, king of Egypt, went up to the king of Assyria to the river Euphrates. And I have to give you some historical background of what is taking place here. You see, it's around this time that Babylon and the Medes and the Scythians all gang up together. Babylon and the Medes, actually, the king of Babylon and the king of the Medes actually form an alliance together, and they attack Assyria, and specifically they attack Nineveh. Uh, the Scythians don't really form an alliance with anybody, but they are they see what's going on, they take advantage of it, and they come down and do some attacking uh, on their own. And Nineveh is destroyed um, in the year 612 B.C. And it, the Assyrian Empire, that great empire, had been the greatest empire the world had ever seen up to that point, is now broken apart and destroyed. Now, Assyria had uh, actually put a king on the throne. This Pharaoh Necho had actually been placed on the throne by the Assyrians. And so he's, he's sort of their man. And notice, uh, he goes up to the king of Assyria to the river because what had happened, the Assyrians had... Uh, the remnants of the Assyrian army had fled to the west to a place called Carchemish. Um, now, there's not many Assyrians left for that. Um, their army had been virtually broken. But now Pharaoh Necho comes up, and he's moving out from Egypt through Judah, through the Levant, all the way up to Carchemish. And there he's going to be met. The Medes have turned around and gone home. The Scythians have turned around and gone home. But the king of Babylon... Actually, the king of Babylon is getting a little bit old, so he's sending his, his crown prince by the name of Nebuchadnezzar. And Nebuchadnezzar is going to meet him uh, at, at Carchemish. Now we read, as that, as that battle's taking place, and, and the scriptures elsewhere will talk about what happens in that battle. Let me just uh, be a, give you a spoiler uh, on this. Nebuchadnezzar is going to win that battle. Uh, Egypt is going to be, be beaten. They'll come running back, but we'll save that for another day. On the way there, that's the point that we want to, to look at here in this chapter. King Josiah went to meet him, uh, and when Pharaoh Necho saw him, he killed him at Megiddo. Now, see, Megiddo is on the road from Egypt to Carchemish. Megiddo is in, it's not in Judah, it's actually to the north of Judah, in what, what had formerly been uh, the northern kingdom of Israel. And it's, it's in that wide open valley. Now, Pharaoh Necho, he was a pharaoh of what was, is called the Saite dynasty, the 26th dynasty. It had actually been appointed, uh, and that dynasty had been sort of established by the uh, by the Assyrians. Uh, the Assyria and the uh, Egyptians had been at war for a time, uh, but he had come to the throne of Egypt now in 610 BC. This is right after the, uh, the fall of Nineveh and, and in those intervening years. Uh, and like I said, he's going to be defeated by Nebuchadnezzar, and they're going to have that conflict, and he'll run back to Egypt and even though he'll make, uh, he'll pretend he's going to come out, it's really not going to happen. We're not going to see e Egyptians come out of Egypt again, um, actually ever. <laughs> um, we'll see people from Egypt who aren't Egyptians do that sort of thing, but that's, that's many hundreds of years later. And so this fine, Josiah actually dies uh, at this place known as Megiddo. If you look here at the Valley of Jezreel, sometimes we call it the Valley of Megiddo. And you can go to the ruins of the city of Megiddo even today. They're still standing there. And that place is referenced when you get to the New Testament in the book of Revelation. Revelation chapter 16, it's in the midst of all of these various visions uh, and happenings that we've been reading about. Um, uh, there have been uh, these uh, seals that have been broken and trumpets blown and vials of wrath poured out. 
And toward the end of all that, verse chapter 16, verse 13, and John says, I saw coming out of the mouth of the dragon and out of the mouth of the beast and out of the mouth of the false prophet, three unclean spirits like frogs, for they are spirits of demons performing signs which go out to the kings of the whole world to gather them together for the war of the great day of God, the Almighty. And then he gives a, almost like a parenthetical statement, Behold, I'm coming like a thief. Blessed is the one who stays awake and keeps his clothes so that he will not walk about naked and men will not see his shame. And then verse 16, this is why we're here. And they gathered them together to the place which in Hebrew is called Har Megiddo. Now Har is the Hebrew word for mountain. So Mount Megiddo. Although we tend to pronounce this as Armageddon. And Armageddon, or the Mount of Megiddo, that's the place where Josiah was killed by Pharaoh Necho. It's a place where the people of God saw great battles, sometimes in victory, sometimes as this one. I don't even know if this is a battle, but but Josiah dies here, uh, sometimes in great defeat. But if you go there and stand on the ruins of Megiddo, like we're standing here, and then look across that valley, on the other side of that valley, there's there's a small town. Actually, it's not quite so small these days. It's gotten quite large. It's the town of Nazareth, the town where Jesus grew up. And I always find it striking that Jesus grew up within eyesight of the ruins of Megiddo, the place that that prefigured this ultimate battle between God's people and those who were not God's people, the place where God will ultimately bring the victory. And of course, Jesus is the one who brought victory upon the cross and will one day return in victory that every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that he is Lord.